Dworkin's Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything. Geopolitics, culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you live from New York City, your host, Pierce Redmond. Okay, everybody, welcome back to another episode of Porkins Policy Radio. As always, I am your host, Pierce Redmond, and you can find this show here at American Freedom Radio, AmericanFreedomRadio.com, as well as on my website, which is PorkinsPolicyReview.com. And if you are new to the show, there are lots of ways to listen. You can always find me on iTunes, TuneIn, Stitcher, uh, Google Play, and also Player FM. Uh, I'm also uh, on YouTube, of course, and you can always follow me through the RSS feed and emails. Uh, I'm also uh, rebroadcast later on in the week on a host of other stations, including uh, Awake Radio and PSN, Ed Opperman's Spreaker Channel, and that's from 10 to midnight on Fridays. And on Saturdays uh, out on uh, KYAH uh, AM 540 in Utah, you can listen to me on Saturdays from 6 to 8. Uh, and uh, quickly, I just want to also uh, say that the very first episode of my new show, Open Minds On Air, is posted up on the Open Minds uh, Foundation website, which is openmindsfoundation.org. It's also on my website. Uh, so uh, please go and check that out. A uh, little forewarning, it was a little rough. It's the first episode. You know, we're still sort of tweaking things, but I'm very excited. We've got uh, we've got another episode, which will probably be released uh, very early, uh, the first week in May or the second week, possibly. But uh, very excited about that. And uh, we'll have some more sort of finalized plans about schedules and stuff. And uh, also, I just want to thank, because I, I just realized I forgot to thank uh, some new subscribers on Patreon. So thank you. Cody, Teresa, Alistair, and Sean, thank you all so much for signing up. Of course, if you want to support my work, you can always go to patreon.com slash Pierce Redmond, and you can uh, become a patron of mine for as little as a dollar a month, which gets you the uh, exclusive bonus podcast. I um, may not have a bonus podcast for this month. I'm trying to sort of put something together before I leave for Ireland. Um, but, uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get that out by tomorrow or, or sometime before I leave. But if not, uh, please do forgive me. I've uh, been, been, been very busy, uh, trying to get, uh, some shows out of the way and stuff like that. But anyway, enough of me, uh, rambling on. We are joined by a good friend of the show and a frequent guest, JP Satilli of newsvandal.com. Uh, also the man behind the News Vandal Rundown, which I highly encourage everyone to sign up for. Uh, JP, how are you? How are you doing? I'm good, and I want to read something to start off this program. Mm. This is a headline, and this is from The Independent UK. They do a lot of good work. Robert Fisk doing a lot of good work. We're going to be talking about that later uh, as in the show. Here it is. Donald Trump's Syria airstrikes will not reduce Assad's military capability, experts say. The date on that, Saturday 8 April 2017 almost a year to the day mm. and the reason i start off with that because we are going to talk about syria obviously and i just think it's fascinating that so many people who support donald trump are convinced that he has in the interim between being elected to make america great again and today that his his administration has been hijacked, that he has been mm. placed under some sort of control or some, some sort of – he's being at least cajoled if not controlled. But they certainly believe he's being manipulated, which you know, with the arrival of John Bolton, everybody thinks, oh my gosh, the neocons are taking over. And I could make a pretty strong case that actually John Bolton and, and Donald Trump have been simpatico for years. But it – I think one of the things that I'm frustrated with about the Syria strikes, I'm, I'm, there are many things I'm frustrated about. One is is the idea that, that Donald Trump is not his own man, that he is really just a patsy or uh, a dupe, and that there are these other forces making the, these decisions when I think it uh, absolves him of the, uh, of the responsibility he holds for these decisions. Oh, yeah. It, it, uh... <laughs> 
absolutely. And as, as JP was saying, we're going to be talking about the serious strikes. It's funny you're just quoting um, from this Robert Fisk article, who is like one of the the last uh, uh, sort of uh, real independent journalists yeah. uh, working within the mainstream. <clears throat> Robert Fisk always sort of goes against the grain, uh, you know, even if he is working for the independent. <laughs> Um, right. And it, it's funny you just sort of mentioned, you know, this isn't going to solve anything. I literally just pulled up uh, – this is from Middle East Eye, um, and this is from uh, Sir- Strikes on Syria Chemical Sites Solve Nothing, Francis yeah. Macron. <laughs> I mean, it's like, again, they're they're saying this, <sighs> is, this is really nothing, which is rich coming from Macron, right. who is apparently taking, you know, the, the sort of – Majority of credit, you know, he's the one that convinced Donald Trump to uh, yes, keep troops. Yes, right, right. Oh, um, yeah, that's right. The keeping of the troops, which Nikki Haley said, yes, we're going to keep the troops. And then, no, we're not going to keep the troops. <laughs> yeah, and then Macron, he went on, like, television in France saying, yes, I convinced Donald Trump. Yeah. Again, Macron, the, this is the um, uh, ostensibly the, the socialist. Um, so, again, I mean, he must be part of the, the globalist uh, deep state that's controlling Donald Trump. But it's 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 funny because Trump seems to actually like Macron. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, th- this is the reason he wanted to have a, a freaking military parade was yeah. because of uh, M- Macron. Because it's an um, interpersonal relationship. Mm. And and this is, I think, one of the things that I, we should all be catching on to right now because he's going to go meet Abe. Abe's his great friend, his great friend. And it's funny – he says all these things about Abe and loves him. He loves to interact with him interpersonally. Great golfer and all that. The same thing about yeah. President G, right? It's these interpersonal relationships that seem to be outside of the stated policy of his administration. You know, Donald Trump is often outside of the stated policy of his administration. <laughs> yeah, you know, that shouldn't be that unusual to people. But I think it's really about these interactional, uh, transactional relationships that he formulates with people. And those are the things that I think um, cause him to believe he can do things that are actually not entirely possible. And um, this this relationship thing is actually kind of on display right now in response to Comey saying that he's like a mob boss. Because if you think about it, everything he does is transactional. That's what I think is going on with with Michael Cohn and this guy Elliot Broidy, right? So Elliot Broidy is the is the guy that Michael Cohn arranged the one point six million dollar payout to cover up the abortion that a playmate a Playboy playmate had after an affair with this guy Broidy. And Broidy was an RNC fundraiser, became came onto the RNC. But here's the interesting thing about Broidy is that prior to raising money for the RNC on behalf of Donald Trump, Elliot Broidy was in business relationships with a guy named George Nader. Yep. <laughs> and George Nader with a guy who, with Broidy, they were trying to sell these weird, like, cell phone technologies with Michael Flynn into the Pentagon. And also, Broidy and Nader were involved, Nader in particular, in the UAE brokered meetings to get Eric Prince to go to the Seychelles to open up a back channel between Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin. So, the question. And, and lobbying against Qatar as well. And lobbying uh, Nader against is, Qatar, yes. Yeah, you important. know, gave millions of dollars to Broidy. Uh, and then this whole bizarre campaign against Qatar happened, which some people believe, speculate, and particularly based on an internet, sto- internet intercept story, may have been in response to the fact that Qatar wouldn't cough up money to Jerry yeah. Kushner. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> tangled webs. Um, so the question is, I had when I heard that Cohen went to Broidy and said, "Hey, I got this service I offer. You know, cleaning up messes. That's what I do. I'm better than the full of rush man." Uh, what, what is that about? Is that simply about doing a buddy a solid or is it about creating these transactional relationships where I kind of know where your bodies are buried now? I'm going to help you bury the body, but I'm going to know where the body is. And since I've done this for you, if sh- something should happen, you know, you kind of owe me. I, I think that's a huge part of how Donald Trump has run his entire business and life. So – it's not surprising that he gets into these gets into a room with Macron and Macron glad hands him. Remember the famous handshake with Macron where Donald Trump has famously he grabs you and he pulls you in and he tries to yank your yes. arm to your side. Well, there's that famous handshake when they first met and Macron yanked him back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know. I mean, you know, 
if you haven't been around French guys, they could be pretty macho. So he was doing his French macho thing. And, and I think that that kind of posturing works with Donald Trump. And so it, that makes a lot of sense. But the fascinating thing about Macron going, getting out over his skis, as it were, about the attack is I noted that the night uh, of the attack when Mattis, Mad Dog Mattis came out, he said, this is a one off. And I thought that it was fascinating because just earlier that night, uh, Donald Trump had signaled in his in his remarks that this is something that could be expansive and continue to go on. No, nope. Mattis said, nope, this is a one off. This is contained. This is just for this purpose. And we've achieved our purpose. And that's it. And say goodnight, Gracie. So, again, here we have this Fisher insight. Now, was it did Trump really want to go? overboard did he want to go go all in the way did macron really say yes let's do it and was it mad dog mattis that put the kibosh on that these are some of the interesting things that actually echo back to what we started the show with because that strike from last year was a strike according to really incredible reporting by cy hirsch and develt was a strike that was basically a kabuki theater strike where mattis up until to the end said, you know, Mr. President, we do not have independent verification of this chemical weapons attack. We cannot independently verify. And Donald Trump said, nope, Ivanka showed me the pictures. I've, I put a, there's a red line in the sand. Uh, he crossed the red line. We have to do this. And so Mattis worked basically with, through back channels with the Kremlin to come up with a target package that would be do the minimum amount of damage that would be completely uh, would be within the bounds of the deconfliction agreement with the with with Russian military in the in that region in the region, and would make sure that nobody no Russian forces no Russian personnel or Russian materials planes would be hurt. And so Trump got his missile attack. I think it was 59 Tomahawks. Raytheon got its payday <laughs> and he got to say, hey, see, I told him you can't cross the red line. He crossed the red line. I did my missiles. Everybody's happy. Nobody gets hurt. And he gets to say, see, I'm better than Obama. Well, and JP, this is this is what I found so sort of fascinating uh, by the, this sort of, you know, serious strike, World War Three, which we'll get into the, the yeah. reality of that statement. But is that like you rightfully said, this has already happened. I th everyone seems to have forgotten that Ivanka showing daddy a video made him bomb Syria a year ago. That's like completely dis. You know, I mean, I, I, I know I, I feel like we, we always kind of bring him up and that's just because I loathe him so much. But, you know, Mike Cernovich getting all yeah. upset and hot and bothered over. I mean, does he it's like he doesn't remember that Donald Trump has been doing this. I mean, the same with Alex Jones's temper tantrum. It's it, do you not remember that he was launching strikes? First off, they've been launching strikes. OK, I yep. mean, you can put your head in, in the sand and pretend like this isn't happening, but they have been launching strikes. The CIA is all over Syria. There's at yep. least 2000 troops that we know of inside Syria. Boots yep. on the ground, you know, Remember, oh, no boots on the ground. There's plenty of boots on the ground, not to mention all of these jihadi groups that were uh, aligned with or in some cases funding. I mean, it, it's it, I, it, it's like theater on such a bizarre yeah. scale because this is all happening. And again, like you said, um, the in the original strike, you know, this was sort of planned with the Russians. Now, there's there's not enough evidence to kind of substantiate that that's the case right now. But, right. you know, you, you wrote an article, JP, uh, on newsvandal.com that will link up to the real message behind Trump's Syrian strike. And, I mean, you, you kind of lay out the, the theory or, or the possibility that, again, this was probably planned with some degree with the Russians. They picked three sites that the Syrians probably knew of, yep. you know, that they were possibilities. As far as we know, there haven't been like casualties or, or I mean, I, I believe there are probably some casualties, but it's not like hundreds of people, you know, weren't dead because of this. So you have to wonder, were these sites evacuated ahead of time? Um, you know, not to mention the, the I, I'm not sure how bombing a chemical site is is safe at all. Um, one would think with this not release chemicals into the air, but we're not even seeing that. 
So again, I mean, are these even chemical weapons sites in the first place? Were there even chemical weapons there? Well, here's um, on the one site, U.S. Marine Corps Lieutenant General uh, um, Kenneth McKenzie, uh, the director of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said on April 14th, I would say they had three buildings there and a parking deck, and now they don't. <laughs> That's what he said about one of the sites. They had three buildings and a parking deck, and now they don't. And one of the reasons they use this overwhelming force, we're talking about 66 Tomahawk missiles and 105 weapons total. Those 66 Tomahawk missiles, by the way, that's $92.4 million on just those missiles. They said we used that overwhelming amount of force not because we wanted to swamp the the target zone so that the Russian air defenses that are in there won't wouldn't have any significant impact on the attack because that's one of the other things because see there's part of me that wonders I mean you could actually make a case well maybe we do this because we know that the Russians have all these these air defenses in there let's test their air, def air defenses in real time and see how they work I mean you could get into that sort of level of postulation and postulating about what the what the intentions were behind the attack but they said they used this overwhelming force because they wanted to make sure they destroyed any secondary chemical explosions right if you just do complete destruction of it and incinerate everything you won't you won't have that fallout apparently I'm not really sure, buying it sure. I'm not buying yeah. it so <laughs> You know, Dunford said, uh, and he is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Dunford, the night at the same time that Mattis talked, uh, the night of the attack, said we, they didn't coordinate. And I, I thought it was interesting that he said that because I thought that that was a reflection of the fact that it came out in the reporting last year that there was coordination. So they wanted to – why would you even make that statement, right? You don't want to make that statement. That's not something that you want to go out of your way to say. If you go out of your way to say something like that, that's because you're trying to cut something off. And then he went on to say, uh, Mattis went on to say, beware of all of the Russian propaganda and disinformation that's going to come out. Was that trying to preemptively stop the possibility? Because I could tell you in the days leading up, there were numerous reports coming out, particularly out of European sources, which, you know, you can't. It's hard to trace because stories get placed. That's one of the things that got the Iraq war going, right, is that U.S propagandists were placing stories in foreign sources so that they would finally cycle through the night news cycle and get into American sources without having directly place them in American sources. So hard to say, but uh, it seemed to me that they were trying to cut off the idea that had come out of the, out of the Hirsch reporting from last year that there was, but look, there's still deconfliction zones and you have to, and you still have to do reporting according to the deconfliction process to let Russia know at, at some point in advance of what's coming and I think you could do all kinds of telegraphing. You could you could easily telegraph your intentions without coordination. And as you point out, if you're going only after chemical weapons facilities, you could basically go to to facilities that have been listed as possible chemical weapon sites and evacuate those and assume that that's where it's going to happen. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I I, I would sort of lean towards that being the case here. Again. <clears throat> We're not – it is uh, – rightfully so. People are – we're terrified. We've, we've seen these videos from, you know, people inside Damascus, you know, bombs going up, missiles and stuff. But it's not as if um, there are reports of, you know, tens of, if not hundreds of, of people being killed. Um, we're not even really getting much on injury reports and things like that. Yeah. So, again, it, it, this seems so much for show, um, almost even more so – than the 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 attack that you know almost came a year before right um you know this is this is it's like such a joke um and then again to get macron uh coming on and saying this isn't going to solve anything um a at all he says um quote let's uh let's look our principles in the face and ask where we want to go these strikes will resolve nothing but they will end a system to which we are becoming used to which is that somehow the right side has become the weak side i mean what what the hell is he even going on about i mean again as if the west hasn't already been doing this i mean they have um right right and uh, but I mean, there's, there's another subtext here which is I, you know, I'm not much on military analysts making a living on cable news after their careers are <laughs> over. <laughs> it's been a you know a bit of an issue here for the last decade or so, um, last 15 years. But there's one guy 
who whenever he talks, I tend to listen to more intently, is a guy named Colonel Jack Jacobs. He's a little kind of a no-nonsense guy. And uh, last Monday or Tuesday, when all of the talk was going on after the – it was after the, you know, the what was it, the gas-killing animals tweet, which I thought mm. – I immediately said, boy, didn't they open up for a toxic airborne event at uh, Bonnaroo one year? Anyway, (laughs) it does sound like an indie rock band. But (laughs) so so after the gas killing animals tree, it was pretty obvious something was coming, you know, and he's and then Trump had the, you know, our our beautiful smart missiles are coming. Russia watch. (laughs) Um, Which is interesting. We should cycle back to because then there was that other meme that was developed by on the alt right and among pro Trump supporters that he wasn't actually in control of his Twitter anymore, that his, tw- his tweets were being written by somebody else. Anyway. Yes. Yeah. Um, Jacobs said, look, the Pentagon knows that the game is over in Syria. It's over. Russia has won. Assad has won. Iran has won. And you know, what is at stake there that Syria provides Russia with a warm water port in the Mediterranean. This is this is a this is not a small deal. This is a big deal, and it is one of the reasons why Assad has been a, a client, and Assad's father had been a client. This is it's and it makes all the sense in the world. It's the same reason why the United States has Guam and Guantanamo Bay and any dozens of bases around hundreds, not dozens, hundreds, right? This is what you this is this is part of the deal, right? A, a power projection. And it makes all the sense in the world. Well, the United States had basically even though they had there was one report about 18 months ago, and I can't remember the name of the two groups, but the CIA was funding a group and the Pentagon was funding a group and they did not coordinate. So there was a point at which there was a battle in Syria where the two groups were fighting each other. <laughs> which tells you what the what America's ham-handed strategy has been there where Russia's objectives have been pretty clear. We support Assad. We are going to stand by Assad. We are going to help Assad win. Assad is winning. The game is over. So on some level is this attack in part, you know, it's in part, it's about the whole red line thing and, you know, international credibility, which I just think is kind of a funny thing anyway. Right. Uh, I'll show you my credibility. I'll launch missiles. Um, I guess if you if you have no diplomatic credibility, you have no moral credibility. The only credibility you have is I can kill you. Um, but I think some of this has to do with a a hail mary at the end of the game to try to try and get a seat at the table. Should this ever get to Geneva for talks? Mm. Because who is who who has a, a a stake in the game? Why are the two thousand troops there? Are the 2,000 troops there to, to, for the Free Syrian Army? The Free Syrian Army's done. The whole thing is done. Are they there for the well, Kurds? There's no opposition. Where is the opposition? You know what I mean? It, it, exactly. They've completely evaporated. Well, they the don't exist. The opposition was the Kurds. <laughs> and, <laughs> exactly. and so the United States kind of shivved the Kurds a couple weeks ago. Because, because of why? Because of Turkey. Because mm. I could tell you if, if, if there are any chemicals coming in and the chemicals are part of a – a uh, a show attack or a false flag attack. I mean, the 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 one party that has the most to gain from the United States not leaving, other than the United States and its international credibility, is Turkey, mm-hmm. right? So, so but where are we back? Let's come back to where Macron is. I think Macron and May, to a lesser extent, are looking for an opportunity to have a seat at the table to try and get some buy in. By taking a moral stand and getting their finger back in the pie in Syria when, according to Jack Jacobs, all the people in the Pentagon know the game is already over and there's and the pie is not something that the West is going to have much of a say in divvying up. No, I, I completely agree with you, JP. I, and I, you know, I, I think we even probably talked about this um, a few months ago uh, at some point. But I mean, it, it is basically over. We, we lost this one. Um, you know, we can uh, we can go through some sort of the mental gymnastics and, and talk about how evil Assad is and how he's a dictator and Nikki Haley can can oh. yell as much as she wants in the Security Council. But uh, this this fight is kind of over. Um, I know it's it's shocking that America might lose a, you know, an international conflict, but sometimes we do. 
and this happens to be a case for this. I mean, again, it, it's just I, I short of sending a, you know, a, a full war battalion, you know, on the level of Iraq, we're right. not going to win in Syria. And again, we didn't even really win in Iraq. I mean, we can no, invade we no. can invade Syria and fight the Iranians and the Russians and Hezbollah along with Assad's forces. Uh, and then also all the jihadi groups that are going to be there, the Kurds. I mean, we, if you really want to, um, you know, uh, fight that battle, I mean, we could do that. But that's that's idiotic. That's that's in, that's a psychotic thing to think. Uh, it, it, it's never going to work. It's never going to pan out. Well, um, I'll give you I'll give you actually one better. I actually don't think America can do it. Yeah, I, no, I, I I do agree with you, Jay. I I don't think I think we're 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 stretched too thin, yes. and there's too much to lose. You know that would mean the collapse of of so much of the American empire that in some ways is sort of you know we're, we're kind of keeping it together with you know band aids and, and bubble right. gum. At this that's point. right. I mean, I think, I that think is we're, a great, uh, that's a great point, Pierce, because I. What I see happening right now is actually America struggling with the end of its very, very short unipolar moment. Mm. And that, you know, that's what is this? The Russia look. We could get into all kinds of aspects of the Russia thing. I think the the funny thing about the about everything and all things Russia is that one, the intelligence community in particular. Their histrionics are are directly directly in proportion to the sense that they are getting their asses handed to them for pennies on the dollar, and it's frustrating the heck out of them. I think this is also an aspect of the fallout of the overreach of Iraq, and that that 15 to 18 year period from the fall of the Berlin Wall to just a few years ago, you know, just what. what the, like the end of Iraq and sort of the Malay setting in in Afghanistan, there is this, I think, understanding that the United States is, like you said, stretched so thin and the bailing wire and the duct tape are barely holding it all together. And nobody really knows. There's no real exit strategy. There's no real sense of how to engage in a denouement, how to how to exit gracefully from American exceptionalism, and that's why I call it the unexceptional end of American exceptionalism, which is one of the ironies about Donald Trump, because on one level, he's right, America first, we're finally going to put America first, which in some ways actually harkens back to the old peace dividend talk after the end of the Cold War. I don't know if you remember the peace dividend, there is this thing that, oh, America's fought the good fight and the American people have shouldered the burden of democracy for all these years, and now that the Soviet Union has fallen we can actually take that peace dividend, that money that we're not going to spend trying to save the mm. world from, from evil pinkos, we're going to be able to spend that at home. And it never happened. Mm. <laughs> um, and it actually turned into the double down after you know, the project for a new American century actually became government. Um, so how do you get out of that now? Well, the, the contradiction that Trump has is on one level, I'm – selling you this America first thing, which, by the way, I think the, in retrospect, the whole Iraq war on the whole attack on the Iraq war as a principle, a failed principle that he used in the uh, campaign was actually just his way of knocking out Jeb Bush, because I think once he knocked out Jeb Bush, it really wasn't a functional part of his rhetoric. His rhetoric then turned to we have to bomb the feces out of them. We got to kill all of their if they're terrorists we got to kill all their families and actually his policy upon becoming president has been one of ramping up airstrikes ramping up special forces operations and ramping up civilian casualties which have spiked dramatically over the course of the last 16 months 18 months so so he has this other track which is that we're going to have the biggest military ever. He's delivering on that, at least in terms of, of the money. We're up to getting up to 17, said what, $715 billion uh, and just defense budget. And if you take all defense spending, William Hartung, one of the great calculators of these things, thinks we're at about $1.4 trillion total in defense-related spending. So he's doing that, and he actually wants America to retain the imprimatur of empire – 
while he prevaricates on some of the more difficult commitments of actually going out and saying, well, we're just going to flood the world with what we, what we do militarily to ensure empire. So, and I think that's also a reflection of where we are as a country, which is we got this empire, but we're not really comfortable with it. And we actually don't even know how to preserve it. Oh yeah. Um, well, that's, I mean, that's, you, you can, you can tell that from Trump's rhetoric and the sort of ever changing, um, you know, thought process that he has. Uh, I mean, he doesn't know. Um, again, we're going to bring the troops home. No, we're leaving them in Syria. Uh, it, it, I also, I think that there is the, um, particularly Macron and France, uh, the, the way that they have sort of stepped up in many ways internationally. I think it's because they, they 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 see an opening. Um, I think yeah. the same is true for for the UK as well. But yeah. you know, um, I, I, again, uh, Fran, French intelligence has uh, re, you know sort of solidified their their hold on much of West and you know North Central Africa. Yeah. Um, you know, Chad, Niger, Great uh, Mali, all of these countries. France has uh, again upped. You know, the, France has long controlled UN peacekeepers, um, yeah. and in the past couple of years, France has utilized UN peacekeepers as a as sort of a, a as a front group in order to extract minerals and to get French intelligence back into former French colonies all over Africa, in particular. Again, Syria and France have a, a long you know history together. So it's it's like no surprise to me that, that that France is kind of stepping up um back into its its once great you know imperial uh domain uh and I think the same is is true for the UK in a lot of ways you know I mean they they they've always sort of um I think the UK has done a a, a fair enough job of sort of letting the US lead um with them sort of off to the side um, but again, I think they're just they're just sort of seeing this. And again, too, with with Donald Trump, who's so obviously um, a weak political figure in many right. ways. Right. This is easy for them. You know, they can they can just kind of step into the void that he's obviously creating. And uh, yeah, I think it's just sort of that's what I, I found so much of, you know, this, this like rhetoric of like World War Three. And this was sort of like everywhere. I mean, definitely on social media. Um, I had a, a work colleague who was texting me on Saturday uh, during the airstrike saying, you know, World War Three just happened, um, you know, while I was at work. And that rhetoric was even going on apparently in Russia. I heard uh, Mark Sploboda on Loud and Clear, which is a radio Sputnik station, saying that there were Russian politicians and, and media were hyping this. And they were saying, you know, start stockpiling food and water. Um, they were uh, – Apparently, Russian media was uh, – they, they were um, uh, listing where fallout shelters were um, as if, what, Trump is going to bomb Moscow right, and right. Petersburg? I mean, come on. Um, but so much of that, this World War III propaganda – I mean, it just seems all kind of for domestic consumption. Yes, maybe. yes. And that's I, – I, it's just it's such a great point because this actually cycles back to Cernovich and to Alex Jones and to everything, to Trump, to everything. Why why do we have to have an airstrike to make Trump look good? I mean, all of these all of these um really get back to where we are kind of as a kind of a global society and culture, which is that everybody is servicing their customers. Mm. That's mm. what it is. You know, if you think about it from the Kremlin's point of view, kind of Win win on some level. I mean, it'd be great if the United States just finally pulled the 2,000 troops out and just said, okay, you know, we'll raise the white flag so that we can continue, we can get on with not only continue with with the the completion of Assad's crushing of his of his internal enemies, but also start the rebuilding process because. You know, I I'm going to assume that there's going to be a lot of money going in. There's a lot of rebuilding to happen there. I mean, again, this gets back to why try and get your finger back into the pie, because after the shooting stops, a lot of money is going to be made. <laughs> right. I mean, this is why you want to have a seat at the at the table. But for 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 uh, the Kremlin, 
what great domestic consumption this is, right? I mean, people can can say, oh yeah, look at Vladimir Putin standing up, and we have these people that are demonizing us overseas. Da 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 da. X Y. Perfect. How about for Mike Cernovich? Mike Cernovich says, well, I supported. I supported. He has this 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 base, this customer base that he has to service. It, to to preserve his brand, much in the way the Kremlin was preserving their brand, and much in the way Donald Trump is preserving his brand, and M- Macron is preserving his brand, I got to preserve my brand with you. So I'm going to have this faux outrage. I'm going to say X, Y, and Z. Da 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 da. Get on board. And oh, by the way, I, in the process, I'm going to generate traffic for myself. And what does traffic <laughs> turn into? Traffic turns into money. I mean, I mean, this is what everybody's doing. You look at you brought up. Um, I know I'm kind of going all over the place here, but I'm trying, I want to catch up with everything that you just said because you have mm. some very important things there. France and uh, and its moment, it's also one of the opportunities it has is to take advantage of the malaise that's happening inside of Germany right now. Angela Merkel's Germany is not yeah. – is, is struggling. So now this is – because Germany has pretty much been calling the shots for the last 20 years inside the EU. So maybe this is part of the opening that he sees. The other thing is, as you made this excellent point about France and Africa, Africa is where all the action is going to be for the next 15 to 20 years, I think. And one of the signals of that is that there was a fascinating story about three and a half weeks ago, four weeks ago, China is now outsourcing clothing factories to Africa. Think about that. Yeah. Think about where we are. And now anybody who's who's following Africa, I, I follow Africa for a number of reasons, but specifically I've had a lot of interest in what's going on with, with the, the, the killing and uh, of rhinos and, and elephants. That has been driven by what? By China's investments in Africa. And China is a soft power investor in Africa. They do have their first sort of military installation in Djibouti and Djibouti is kind mm-hmm. of like the United Nations of military bases. Everybody's Djibouti yeah. is like, yeah, come on in. You want us, you want an airstrip? We got, we will set you up. But mostly what they're doing is they're building infrastructure because they want access to raw, raw materials. They want access to rare earths because rare earths are, are fairly plentiful in places like the Congo and other places around Africa. Rare earths go into making high tech equipment like, like smartphones. So they're building roads and bridges. They're pouring money in, sometimes causing backlash and resentment in Africa. But the, that's the Chinese idea. We're going to create interlocking economic relationships in Africa and this outsourcing of a factory at a time when Donald Trump is trying to force China to give factories back to us so that we can put people to work. China's like, well, you want to know what? It's actually cheaper for us to build our have our clothing made in Africa now. So I see Africa as the next frontier of this globalization process, and the United States is doing it through what? Through military bases. Through they now the United States finally got the go ahead. We can have armed drones in Niger, mm-hmm. and as you pointed out, who has a big interest in Niger? Well, France, of course, you, uh, and that's where Niger powers almost like some. There's some crazy statistic. I don't quote me on it, but Niger like powers something like a third of France through uranium that's mined there that's owned outright by a, a a French company with serious ties to the French state and that uranium then goes to the nuclear power plants that that power most of France yeah. yep not to mention you know to just sort of go off topic but not to mention too that uh Niger all these countries are on the the um the the central african uh franc which is still Printed in France and controlled by the French government, the the literal physical money of all these West African countries is controlled by France. And believe it or not, in all of these, uh, you know, the, the 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 equivalent of like their treasury departments and stuff like that, banking in in these West African countries, there's almost always a white Frenchman behind the scenes controlling the the flow of money into these countries. Yeah, that's right. Colonial the colonial period did end, right? I think it ended, didn't it? I could have sworn it ended. And and the United States, through corporate interests, has had a similar role in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. We've just done. The United States has often done it through th- through companies like Chevron because of the integration of Chevron with the national security state. 
because there's you know there's a reason why all those oil men seem to be become secretaries of state over the course of the years, right? I mean, it's not coincidental, right? James Baker is not a coincidence. So, um, and also the fact that the CIA, when it started, was really sort of an outgrowth of the intersection of Wall Street, Wall Street finance, and then the oil industry with the desire to have basically a government-sanctioned private army that it could use to crack heads and bend arms and create reciprocal relationships. So, you know, this maybe what we're seeing here is kind of the beginning of a formulation of a multipolar world where co- where countries like France can begin to exert influence, where Iran can exert influence, where China is exerting influence, where Russia is obviously exerting influence. Mm. And this is maybe the new reality that that the foreign policy blob, people like to talk about the deep state. And I'm not a fan of the use of the term deep state because when I think of the deep state, I'm thinking of the old sort of Peter Dale Scott version of the deep state, which is what I just was talking about and describing, which is that intersection that happened particularly after the end of World War II when the OSS transitioned to the CIA. And the deep state was that 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 place where private finance and corporations uh, interfaced with uh, covert and intelligence and military um, operations and created this this sort of shadow government that where decisions were probably often made more often than not on the back nine of a golf course or at a at a private club over cigars and brandy and that's to me that's the deep state that i recall the the deep state of the post-world war ii period i think the deep state is mostly kind of dissolved over time and uh, ben rhodes not somebody who i'm generally apt to quote (laughs) or give credit to but ben rhodes of the obama administration talked about a foreign policy blob and this, he was talking about the blob when he was talking about trying to sell the Iran nuclear deal, which I was still amazed got got through. And the blob, he, the way he refers to the blob is it's this sort of mass of groupthink about American exceptionalism and America's role in the world and where America should be. And you actually don't have to be like an active agent of the deep state. It's just that there's so much momentum behind the idea of American exceptionalism and that our national interests somehow seem to be located all over the world. <laughs> mm. it's not our, aren't, the, aren't those our international interests then, not our national interests? Because I think, you know, like roads and bridges are national interests, but internet. Anyway, so our, inter, our national interests are always located overseas. And this is part of the foreign policy blobs idea that the United States is there to, you know, uphold democracy, which if you upon examination seems just completely fatuous if not if not totally comical all of these principles are part of a group think that it's very very difficult to fight once you get inside the beltway because everybody just kind of agrees that this is how it's kind of supposed to be so to do something outside of the blob's parameters is very very difficult to do which is what the Iran nuclear deal was but it can be done i just think that the the blob has grown comfortable with the idea in the post-Cold War period that we were in a unipolar moment. Remember uh, uh, Francis Fukuyama, the end of history and the last mm. man, the end of history. That's right. Human civilization will not have to evolve anymore. We've won. This is how it's going to be. And guess what? It doesn't turn out to be true. As a matter of fact, Francis Fukuyama has said that he was in error when he said that then, because actually it turns out that that the rest of the world was maybe on its heels for a while or maybe in the shadow of this moment of sort of bloated American importance, but it's deflating and in no small part and not coincidentally, it's deflating because it was punctured by the hubris of the people who tried to extend it to its furthest reach. And that would be the neoconservatives. Right. Um, I, (sighs) A lot, a lot. I want to uh, kind of unpack there, JP, and, um, but not too much time. We got like 15 minutes or so, I think, left. But um, you know, uh, you know, one thing that just sort of uh, cropped into my mind. Um, you're talking about, you know, we're moving into this like multipolar world. I, I wonder, you know, if that's why uh, we've seen Netanyahu and Israel becoming, um, you know, uh, openly attacking Syria. 
Um, sure. Because again, they're, they, I mean, they, they can read the tea leaves better than, than a lot of other people. I mean, yep. they, they are about to become, um, more of a pariah in the Middle East in that if the U.S. Uh, is is diminished somewhat, then you know Israel cannot fully be the enforcer uh, in the Middle East and get away with everything. Which, would expl- if- which explains Saudi Arabia. Yeah, exactly. Why right. did he oh, embrace yeah. Mohammed bin Salman? Oh, 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 absolutely, exactly. Well, right. No, no, no. Of course. I mean, you know, and, and you know, well, beggars and, can't be choosers. And, this right, is- but MBS is seeing the same thing. That even though. Mm-hmm. There's this. We got a little bit of a bump out of out of Trump. They probably, I guess, that would be the Trump bump. They're seeing, you know, in the long term, we probably can't rely on the United States. Oh, that that that's why you see MBS with these ludicrous. Uh, you know, we're going to modernize Saudi yeah. Arabia in about three thousand years. You know, we'll and we'll we'll have a Disneyland and all this other stuff. I mean, it's uh, because again, I mean, he's seeing that you know, they're, people are not going to be buying our oil forever. Um, or even so, I mean, more, more terrifying is that there's going to be Iranian oil. There's going to, you know, there, there's going to be other oil. I mean, if Syria ever rebuilds, I mean, Syria has oil. Syria could become, um, you know, again, the, the sort of pipeline politics, uh, a, a pipeline through Syria out in, right into the Mediterranean if they want to. Right. From um, Iran, from the Caucasus. Yeah. And exactly. there's your warm water port, and then you don't have to. You don't even have to deal with the fact that the fifth fleet is over in the Persian Gulf. No, exactly for sure. And then you're right there into southern Europe. I mean, it it, yep. it, it you know um, again, I'm not trying to like promote oil, but it it's certainly it's it's not a bad thing to go. You know, um, I don't know, taking a little bit of that power away from Saudi Arabia. But again, obviously, that's what Mohammed bin Salman sees. I mean. That's what's so funny. It, it it does. If you want to accept it, if you want to look at reality, you can see it's all there. Yet there, like you said, there's so much theater. It's World War Three. Um, you know, this is it. Uh, uh, start stockpiling your food. Um, again, the the deep state has has uh, they they've brainwashed Trump. I mean, I saw I saw these things saying that you know they had implanted a chip in Trump's <laughs> yeah. brain. You know, and this is making him tweet that way. And this is why, first off, he's always been like this, okay? Always. Um, again, the airstrikes are nothing new. Troops on the ground are nothing new. His insane, psychotic rhetoric towards the Middle East and, and Arabs in general is nothing new. He's been doing this. The, you know, if you fooled yourself into thinking that he was somehow – you know, an anti-war, anti-interventionist, 9-11 truther. Well, fine. But, you know, welcome back to Earth. You know, I'm glad you've you returned through the Stargate. But this is this is what it's really like. Um, and I don't know. It, it, it's funny, too, seeing all of these people as you, you know, I, I hate to dredge it up again, but, you know, the Cernoviches, the Alex Jones, even apparently I think Ann Coulter is finally um, – yeah, you know, come to her senses. But they're all they all see it, too. They're all jumping off the, the Trump bandwagon um, quickly uh, so that, uh, you know, they, they can all be. Oh, you know, I was you know, I, I was uh, with him until I was against him. And I realized. Well, but, they also yeah, they also want to preserve their customer base. And they the question is also, will this this Trump idea last beyond Trump? And there is some posturing to try and figure out what's going to, you know, who's going to have the mantle in a post-Trump world, particularly as Trump's problems continue to mount, you know, on mm. particularly on the Michael Cohen front, because there there is going to be a post-Trump period. And <laughs> is the idea going to last beyond him or is it something that is so inexorably tied to him that nobody's going to continue to uh to be able to sustain it or continue to profit off of it, off of it, because like, I think most of it is actually just motivated by simple economics, right? Mm. Alex, Alex Jones, Cernovich, Ann Coulter, most of these people are are they're what are they in it for? They're making money. Yeah, exactly. They get money That's off it. of it. They're selling an idea. I think one of the interesting things, though, is you know the same thing is actually happening on the other side. Where Chuck Schumer comes out and says this is the right thing to do, da 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 da, and then he gets attacked by the Greenwalds and the Caitlin Johnstones and all of them on the other side, because there's also mm-hmm. that other side that goes in the same direction. They're doing the World War Three thing and all that too. That's happening on both sides. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Oh, don't even get me started on. I, yeah, I know, I know. I, 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 <laughs> after I brought it up, I was like, maybe I shouldn't have said the name because it's like it is actually one of the most toxic names out in the 
out in the oh, uh, and she's just uh, as bad. She's yeah. like you said. I mean, she again. The, the, that's what. There's also this disgusting, you know, the the so-called left and the so-called you know anti-interventionist right. They sell war like it, it's nothing. You know, again, fear porn. And Caitlin Johnson is so guilty of that. Yeah. You know, we need to form this coalition with, uh, you know, Mike Cernovich and others to stop the first. It, we've been bombing Syria. You know, I mean, this isn't there's nothing new to this. We'll, we'll probably continue to bomb them. I mean, the empire is not going to collapse overnight. Yes. Um, yes. You know, but and I don't think World War Three is going to happen overnight. Right. Um, you know, this is uh, this is I think a lot of this is uh, it, this sort of reminds me a bit of um uh, something uh, I we uh, I've talked about before on the show the, the whole the uh, the um this book the Unquiet Frontier um, by uh, A. West Mitchell who's Victoria Newland's um, position right now and Jacob Greigel who's also in the State Department this is like probing this is this is sort of what the foreign policy establishment is about is we need to probe we need to see what we can we can get away with and what we can do um, so we're probing we're we're launching these airstrikes. Let's gauge what the actual sort of like response to this is. How far can we go up to the line? While again, also realizing that, you know, we need to we need to look more towards Asia. Um, You know, I think the Middle East is always going to sort of be like that. But, you know, Africa, Asia, those sorts of things. That's really more what we are. And I wonder if Trump isn't sort of like, you know, we're going to kind of put him in, put him in there as the sort of, you know, end of, of the empire. Um, and then, you know, we'll have a responsible, you know, CIA connected politician that comes in next to kind of pick up the pieces uh, and perhaps shift American power away from an overt to more of a covert. Yeah, um, I, I, I think that is a highly plausible uh, um, sense of what is going on, as a matter of fact. Now, I'm, whether he was installed and installed by these people, because you know, if you think about his core constituencies, among them big oil and the mm. defense industry, you know, big beneficiaries, Wall Street, big beneficiaries. To me, that's like a deep state all star lineup right there. <laughs> but this is the I think this is where we're at. And in a sense, that's why I divide the Obama administration into they're almost like two administrations in terms of foreign policy. There's the. Hillary Clinton, Obama administration, and then there's the Obama Unleash administration, where all of a sudden it's like, well, yeah, you know, I'll I'll sell Israel all the weapons they want, and I'll sell Saudi Arabia all the weapons they want, but I'm going to kind of poke them, hmm. and I'm going to make them feel like I'm not really their friend. And by the end of his, of his administration, both Saudi Arabia and Israel were not happy with Obama. The, the Iran nuclear, nuclear deal was a part of that, but the Iran nuclear deal was one of these gambits. And then Obama going to C- Cambodia and being excoriated for essentially apologizing for the secret war, which wasn't really a full-throated apology that somebody like I would like to see as a historian, but it was more than you know anybody else had ever done. I think that kind of idea that maybe it's time for America to move out of of force projection – and do what America does best, which has always been covert action, although I would argue that it doesn't really do it as well as it thinks it does. Mm. But the game is being changed on two levels. It's being changed in terms of propaganda uh, efforts and wars by Russia and by soft power on a part of China. And trying to deal with these two new realities in a multipolar world, I think, is a very vexing situation right now for a country that continues to double, triple, quadruple, quintuple down on massive military spending and and force projections and a massive network of bases. Because China, even though it's having some issues with its belt and road, it's got this sort of debt diplomacy thing where it's getting countries into interlocking relationships by giving them money that they go into debt with and they become clients. That's something that the United States used to do with military power. Mm -hmm. We're going to make you a client to military power. China's making them clients to financial power. And how does the United States deal with the fallout of this? That's that's what we're going to be seeing over the course of the next five to ten years. Absolutely. Uh, J.P. Satilli, thank you so much for joining me. Of course, uh, please do check out newsvandal.com. And uh, I will hopefully be up with Robbie Martin in the second hour. So please stay tuned.
Yes, I like very much radio. They're an American institution. American Freedom Radio. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our stringent quality controls and absolute zero GMOs plus testing for heavy metals makes us unique in the storable foods market. Our line of fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Take out the amount you need and reseal the package for use within the next six months. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's www.simplycleanfoods.net today. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high fructose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, (laughs) you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company, which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. I don't like words that hide the truth. I don't like words that conceal reality. I don't like euphemisms. And American English is loaded with euphemisms because Americans have a lot of trouble dealing with reality. Americans have trouble facing the truth. So they invent the kind of a soft language to protect themselves from it. I'll give you an example of that. When I was a little kid, if I got sick, they wanted me to go to the hospital and see the doctor. Now they want me to go to a health maintenance organization. Smug, greedy, well-fed white people have invented a language to conceal their sins. It's as simple as that. The CIA doesn't kill anybody anymore. They neutralize people. The government doesn't lie and engages in disinformation. Israeli murderers are called commandos. Arab commandos are called terrorists. Contra killers are called freedom fighters. Well, if crime fighters fight crime and firefighters fight fire, what do freedom fighters fight? They never mention that part of it to us, do they? Never mention that part of it. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow. Friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom, and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs, and artillery batteries not included. Launch sequence initiated. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Need to turn the audio out. Control is good. Five. Your mind to experience American Freedom Radio. Walkins Policy Radio, offering a unique perspective on everything geopolitics. Culture creation, the reality of the world we live in. Coming to you 
live from New York City. Your host, Pierce Redman. Okay, everybody, welcome back to Porkins Policy Radio. I am your host, Pierce Redman. Uh, if you are joining us right now, in the first hour, we had J.P. Satili on, and we are about to be joined by uh, another good friend and frequent guest on the show, Robbie Martin. But uh, quickly, I just wanted to um, let everybody know once again that the uh, the first episode of Open Minds on Air is available, both on the Open Minds website and on my website as well. So please do check that out uh, if you have not. I think it's going to be a really fun show. I'm very excited to uh, to kind of uh, build it and, and and see where it goes. But uh, we, as I said, we are joined by Robbie Martin of MediaRoots.org and a very heavy agenda.com. Robbie, are you there? Yes. Hi, Pierce. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, well, I I don't I I take it you probably weren't able to uh, to hear uh, JP and I talking, but we in the first hour we were kind of. Um, you know, talking about the, these, you know, these Syrian airstrikes, which um, were apparently new to a lot of people. But again, if you were paying attention, Trump has already been launching airstrikes on Syria. This is nothing new. This seems very much uh, kind of like, um, you know, theater and stuff like that. And JP and I were sort of talking about the that that we were kind of viewing this through the lens of the sort of decline of the American empire. Um, that, you know, essentially it's over in Syria. This is sort of more like a last hurrah um, for Trump and, and but more specifically for the sort of large global American empire. And Robbie, I wanted to kind of get into um, the, this, uh, this stuff with, with Skripal, which you and I were, were sort of chatting the other day that we kind of view this, the, the Skripal cases as more serious and perhaps as more of a, a kind of um, the next level or the next stage in this sort of fight. But I guess I just wanted to throw it to you quickly, Robbie. I mean, any any kind of thoughts on the serious strike and um, and the idea that this is sort of like a, more like a, um, a bookend in many ways to uh, American foreign policy? Um. Yeah, I mean it's it's hard to say when the when that bookend actually uh happened because it, it, if you go back to Obama's red line declaration, um I almost see that bookend as happening sort of back during that time period because um that was a huge reversal on the part of just the sort of the American war posture that we had really I mean I can't think of another event in American history that resembled that, where it seemed like all the forces in this country, in the media class, and in the Obama administration were aligning to launch some kind of full-scale assault on Syria. Um, and just all of a sudden, it became this diplomatic effort to remove chemical weapons from Syria with the help of uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin. And I, I feel like after that happened, um, there has been basically a symbolic uh, shift um, that is pretty enormous in, in a lot of ways, but yet I feel like we're not really seeing how that shift has been playing out maybe on the surface level until more recently. So I agree with you in the sense that this more this more recent bombing sort of shows is evidence that that sort of era is is kind of in decline or is over in some regard, but I also feel like it's been over, at least symbolically, for, for many years, um, which is a good thing in a lot of ways. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, um, you know, I, I would certainly applaud the end of the American empire, or, or certainly the decline of it. And uh, I, I guess, you know, it, um, like you said, I think this has sort of been happening. And again, it's not like it's going to happen overnight. Obviously, um, but the the sort of World War Three rhetoric, you know, that's that's just kind of overblown and whatnot. Now, on the on the flip side of all of this, I do find it really fascinating that the sort of spy versus spy uh, kind of stuff that has been kind of uh, way more uh, prevalent, way more sort of exaggerated. At least, you know, I think we live in in an information age where it's a lot harder to kind of cover up spies killing each other. But, you know, there does also seem to be a marked increase in that. And it's it's scary that it's also being 
uh, along with that is the use of chemicals and poison. I mean, we can we can look at the uh, the assassination of Kim Jong Nam in uh, I believe it was in a Malaysian airport where he was doused with I don't know a washcloth that had VX on it, um, supposedly at the you know behest of uh, Kim Jong Un. Uh, I don't really yes. quite know what Kim Jong Un gained out of that. I mean, Kim Jong Nam was not going to suddenly um, be, you know, he was not going to be installed uh, by the CIA as the, you know, the, the Western leader of uh, North Korea. But, you know, we had that. We, um, we've obviously had these what appear to be uh, chemical attacks in Syria, although we're not sure who's really behind them. And I, I would lean more towards it not being Assad because, again, what does he really have to gain from this? And now most recently – in uh, England, we've had the this uh, the Skripal affair, and Robbie, you actually did an amazing episode that we will link up to, and I highly encourage everyone to listen to it um, on Media Roots with our our good friend Tom Secker dissecting the whole Skripal case. And this, to me, again, seems more serious than the serious stuff in in so many ways, and and a big one because Theresa May linked Skripal to the strikes in Syria. And maybe you can kind of uh, elaborate on that a little bit, Robbie, because it that in a lot of ways is much more frightening to me um, than, you know, Donald Trump saying mission accomplished. Of course. I mean, it's 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 um, it puts a whole new spin on, I think, global affairs in a way that we maybe haven't really seen since like uh, early 2001 or sorry, late 2001 after 9-11, where. We, we basically launched into this era after 9-11 where it was like, what's the next attack going to be? Is it going to be a nuke being dropped in New York? Is it going to be a chemical weapons attack? Is it going to be an anthrax attack? And then just mm -hmm. coincidentally, you know, and in almost sort of this perfect way for the neocons, the anthrax attacks happened um, less than a month after 9-11. And we were, you know, we, we became uh, basically fear-mongered for many years about this idea that terrorists were going to get a hold of biological weapons, chemical weapons, and use them in sort of a, you know, in sort of a religious martyrdom style way where they wouldn't care how many people they took out. You know, the neocons even tried to make that argument about Iran since they're crazy religious leaders. They would say um, that a country like that having nukes is a danger to everybody because they'll just like do like a basically a suicide bombing and blow everybody, like the whole world up. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, of course. that's kind of been... So that, that's been, the, you know, it was a neocon mindset for a long time. But if you look at sort of their early roadmap for a lot of this fear-mongering propaganda, and I would really argue that it was sort of designed to um, create situations later down the road. It wasn't just normal propaganda. It's in the mold of rebuilding America's defenses with suspiciously very prescient things uh, dropped in there. And one of the things that I, I, that sort of comes to mind for me is Judith Miller – um, was very involved in spreading sort of this anthrax fear-mongering propaganda after 9-11. We already know she was willing to go to jail to protect Scooter Libby, uh, um, who Trump just pardoned some, for some reason, which is very bizarre. We could maybe talk about that a little later. Yeah. But Judith Miller, Judith Miller wrote a book called Germs that came out two days before the first anthrax letter hit the United States, which goes into all this detail in the book about how um, – it, it's it's terrorists who we have to worry about carrying out these attacks, but it's the state actors behind them who we really should be more concerned about. And in her book, she lists not just Iraq as the main potential state actor that could give anthrax to a terrorist group like al-Qaeda, but she also spends quite a bit of time in the book going after Russia. Now, I found that kind of just a bizarre, you know, random thing up until this Skripal incident. And the more I think about it, the more I, I feel like this might have been a narrative that was planned possibly 15 you know, years ago, or, you know, even around the time of 9-11, that perhaps um, with the anthrax attacks and some of these other chemical weapons attacks, that there, was, there were people who wanted to link those to Russia at the time as well. Now, that's just speculation on my part, but I feel like um, this, this most recent incident with the Skripal's is is just almost too classic um it seems 
it has all the hallmarks of one of these kinds of operations and, and, and including all the propaganda surrounding it too. Um, and, and as I talked about with Tom, I mean, one of the main takeaways from my discussion with him and, and most of the credit of the, all that research goes to Tom because, you know, I interviewed him after he did a wonderful podcast about it on his mm. clandestine show. Um, but one of the main takeaways was we don't even really know what this incident was. So to say it was a chemi- to even just say it was a chemical weapon attack or they were um, gassed or, or um, drugged or, or poisoned with some kind of nerve agent, we don't, I, I feel like there's not even enough evidence to even determine that that happened at all. Um, now, the Russian government just came out and preempted a Swiss lab report, um, and the Russian government is now claiming that it wasn't a nerve agent, so to speak, but it was actually a aerosolized drug weaponized hallucinogen made by the U.S. government called BZ. Um, and that just recently came out a couple of days ago. Uh, and that's a very odd claim kind of out of left field. And I'm not sure why, why Sir, it was Sergei Lavrov who actually said it. So I'm not sure what his motivation was for coming out and saying that before any official Swiss lab reportings come out. But, I mean, it just goes to show how there's such a lack of um, – factual information, forensic information coming out of the investigation that we don't really, we can't really determine what happened. I mean, and all, and then when you factor in the fact that the Skripals seem to be alive and well, um, and the daughter specifically right. seems to be completely lucid, totally fine, made a full recovery, it does bring into question what were they actually poisoned with and how did they survive a Novichuk attack, which is supposed to be five to eight times more potent than sarin gas. Well, clearly it wasn't Novichuk. Um, you know, they can still bandy that about and they can they can claim that it's Novichuk. But obvi- if it was, it was the weakest form of Novichuk ever, because apparently it couldn't kill an elderly man like Skripal, um, who, again, was not he's not like healthy. Um, you know, no, no offense to him. But I mean, he didn't look like he was, you know, exercising daily and you know, eating right. I mean, he looked like a, you know, a a chubby, retired KGB agent. So if it couldn't kill him, I mean, I I just highly doubt that it really was Novichuk. Um, And I mean, at one point, again, yeah, people should also check out uh, Tom's episode on clandestine about it. And also, if um, I'll I'll link up to it, um, the Moon of Alabama blog um, has also done some really interesting um, uh, reporting on it. I mean, at one point, it was it, they were even floating the idea that it was just food poisoning, that it wasn't well, even. Can I interject? Uh, interject something really yeah, quick. Sure. So websites like Moon of Alabama and other websites that have been pushing back really hard on this, on this, not just the Skripal case, but also the Syrian alleged Assad chemical weapons attack, have been experiencing DDoS attacks for the past several days, um, to mm-hmm. the point where Moon of Alabama's website was inaccessible all day yesterday when I was trying to look at it. So just thought I'd throw that in as a side note. There seems there appears to be a, a coordinated effort to not just marginalize all of these dissenting voices, but also just to completely erase them off the internet. Mm-hmm. Oh no, I, yeah, I, I uh, completely agree because again, the, the, the Skripal case, it, it keeps changing at such a rapid pace. And again, we live in, in such an information age at the moment where you can't really control these stories, you know, when it's, it's, oh, it was Novichuk. Oh, but they're alive. Well, it was food poisoning. No, it was really something else. Um, now, you know, like you said, Lavrov has said that it's BZ. Um, and he, I, I'm, I just pulled it up. This is on Sputnik. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. But, um, you know, it's saying that uh, Russia expects an answer from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons on whether it was BZ or not. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if, if they come out with that, um, I mean, the, 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 the first thing that we should just sort of mention, I mean, BZ is a toxin that the U.S. has developed and has used for years. And this goes all the way back to the earliest stages of, <clears throat> excuse me, things like, you know, uh, Project Artichoke and MK Ultra. Um, people who have seen the movie, uh, Jacob's Ladder, um, will, uh, that BZ is the, the toxin that, uh, all of those soldiers were exposed to in Jacob's Ladder, which is a very interesting movie that kind of does touch on, um, the U.S. Army's experimentation with 
psychotropic drugs yes. on soldiers. Um, and I mean, Robbie, anything you want to, uh, just sort of on the BZ stuff, I know you said you wanted to talk about it a little bit and I, I am, I'm fascinated. The, the BZ thing, when I saw that, um, I mean, my initial thing was that it's so out of left field that they, there has to be something to it. That's a pretty wild claim to make. And if it is BZ, it's almost certainly came from the U S or the UK. Well, absolutely. I mean, that's what's, it's, it's such an out of left field claim, Pierce, that it's almost normally an out, totally out of left field claim like that. I'd be like, well, that's wacky. Why would they pull that mm. out? But it's so out of left field and such an obscure thing to mention that it does, that it did intrigue me quite a bit. And I, I mean, I think that it's genuinely worth looking into because just on a gut level, when the Skripal incident first happened, when it was described that they found them slumped over on a bench, that they were comatose, my mind immediately went to some kind of drug. Um, mm -hmm. And, and you know, one of the things that came to mind was, well, we, you know, we remember uh, back to when that hostage theater, uh, uh, I don't remember the exact date or, or who was behind it, but there was a hostage crisis incident in, in Russia where that it, it was inside of a theater and the Russian government used an aerosolized form of fentanyl um, yes. to try to stop the t like the hostage taking. It ended up killing a lot of the people in the theater. Um, so that came to mind. Um, and and you know this is going to sound nuts, like I'm, I'm making this up, but BZ also came to mind for me. It just crossed my mind really briefly. I was just going through my mind thinking of different aerosolized drugs you know, sort of weaponized drugs that could be used. And those are two possibilities that just sort of randomly floated in my head. So when Sergei Lavrov came out and said that, I was like, that's very interesting. <laughs> and even though he might be completely off base, uh, the fact that he would just come out and say that publicly before the Swiss lab, I, I, I think is, is worth looking into why he's so sure of something like that. And also most Americans have no idea what it is. So it's not like it would generate since, you know, a lot of headlines or anything. Um, but just on, in terms of what BZ actually is, uh, when Jacob's Ladder came out in 1990, uh, the director for it actually, um, he, he said, you know, he admits at the end of the movie that this was sort of loosely based on these BZ, this existence of BZ. But when people would interview him about his film, he would say, well, there's no evidence that the U.S. government or the military ever actually used any of this stuff. We just know that they made it because there's records of them manufacturing it. Um, however, um, I think it was around 2012, uh, a lawsuit was filed by eight U.S. military veterans um, against every branch of the Defense Department, pretty much, um, even Attorney General Eric Holder at the time. Um, and basically, they're, they're suing them for being part of a human drug experimentation program at Edgewood, Edgewood, Edgewood Arsenal, um, mm -hmm. which shows that they were experimented on with mescaline. LSD and amphetamines, and they also claim they were subjected to experimentation with BZ. Um, and now we know that to be the case, that this is this has all come out in public uh, FOIAs and public document um, uh, releases that have happened since then, but it's been proven now uh, that there was actual human experimentation with B done with BZ to the point where there's actual military trip reports. And just so people understand what BZ is and why I call it a weaponized hallucinogen is because BZ is loosely based on um, a, a hallucinogenic drug, which is found in nature called atropine, um, which is usually found in combination with scopolamine in plants like Datura um, and things like that. Um, they're very commonly found around the United States. Angel's trumpet um, has scopolamine and atropine in them. So essentially what the U.S. government did is they weaponized what is considered a very dangerous, already a very dangerous hallucinogenic drug in nature. It's not something that people even take recreationally. This is not like DMT or something like that. This is what's normally ca classified as a deliriant, um, which is different from a hallucina hallucinogen in the sense that it actually gives you fever-like hallucinations, the type of hallucinations you would get if you were extremely sick, um, like full-blown hallucinations of human figures walking into your room, speaking to you, you know, conversations you'll be having with someone else and they'll just disappear. So those are the kinds of effects that, that BZ um, would have in you. And just so people out there know that I'm not making this up, there was an actual, in the lawsuit, a document came out um, showing that 
the U.S. government had data on the solubility of BZ in human blood. So that's really all you need to know, that they were actually doing human experimentation with BZ. This is not something that they just invented and were, you know, too nice to use on any human subjects. They definitely did. And, you know, who knows uh, what that's been used for since. Um, and then to, you know, keep in mind, this was in the 1960s. So think of all the developments that the U.S. government could have been doing since then with other kinds of weaponized drugs. So it, it really does raise a lot of questions about what, you know, is this, the, the, are there stockpiles of this stuff still out there? I mean, there probably are actually. Um, on record somewhere. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm sure there are. Yeah, and again, I, I, right, there is no doubt that BZ was used. Um, you know, again, you can, uh, people can come up with, you know, whatever sort of reasons to deny it, but it, it totally was used. I, I even remember, Robbie, I even remember seeing something, uh, that, you know, the, the like rumors that, that, again, that they had, that someone, that they used BZ in Syria. At some point um, that that was some I believe it was in reference to like some sort of a State Department cable. So, again, there's no you know, this was like things that they had heard that, may, you know, um, you know, rumors or something like that. Uh, but that, you know, BZ had been used in Syria at one point. So, again, a vague uh, reference. Again, I don't think anyone is really you'd have to be a bit of a foreign policy nerd to kind of like parse through and remember those sorts of things. But you know, it, it is out there. And again, I'm sure they're, they use BZ. Um, I just but, I just found it. If you want me to actually read to you what it what it was. It sure. Was, yeah, um, yeah, please. Go ahead, Ronnie. In, in, it's this from Wikipedia. It says, in January 2013, an unidentified U.S. administration official referring to an undisclosed U.S. State Department cable claimed that Syrian contacts made a compelling case that Agent 15, a hallucinogenic chemical similar to BZ, was used in Hong. Um, and that's, that's pretty much all it says, um, a similar to BZ. So that's mm -hmm. very interesting if there are like BZ analogs or drugs like it out there. And it wouldn't surprise me if there are, because, you know, these chemicals, um, atropine and scopolamine, you know, are, have a very long history in medicine. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all if there's other, you know, weaponized forms of them floating around out there. Yeah, and it, I mean it, it's it's crazy too if they were um, from what I gather from that statement. I mean they're saying that um, that it wasn't uh, you know that, that somebody was using BZ, in, and they, it, I don't believe they said it was necessarily Assad. They're just saying that they they believed that something similar to BZ was being again where where who who got the BZ. Um, or the, the exactly, BZ like yeah. chemical um, that you know might have been spraying it. It's funny too, um, and I think this is sort of purely coincidental. Um, but you know, we, there's also this um, there's an Errol Morris documentary, Wormwood, um, that recently came out on Netflix that, that uh, some people might have seen, and that deals with uh, Edgewood Arsenal and uh, the murder, the probable murder of Frank Olson, who was part of the CIA's MK Ultra program. Um, who uh, and again, some of the things that Olson, um, you know, worked on were things like BZ. You know, that was when he was at Edgewood Arsenal. Um, uh, BZ was one of the chemicals that they were exposing troops to. And, you know, Frank Olson, of course, ends up, um, quote, jumping out of uh, like the 23rd story, uh, you know, room of uh, a hotel room window um, to his yep. death. And he was probably thrown out by the by a, some CIA handlers of, of his. Um, but to kind of bring it back, uh, bring it back in a little bit, Robbie, I mean, the, the like kind of terrifying thing about all of this, I mean, is that like, again, I mean, they're just, they just, this to me is more scary because um, it's not, it, it doesn't at all seem controlled. And the, the script all thing really doesn't seem controlled. I mean, again, I, I, lean more towards this being some sort of a, a Western orchestrated event, but it doesn't even seem like they really took much precaution with any of this. Um, I mean, I mean, who really, I don't know if, was this a chance sort of a thing? Um, and now, you know, we've got these interesting uh, statements coming out from Yulia Skripal, where obviously, you know, Russian intelligence intercepted her phone calls where she's talking about uh, how she wants to come back to Russia. 
And now suddenly um, nobody knows where she is. Presumably MI5 is uh, keeping her hostage in, in a safe house somewhere. Um, you know, I mean, it, it just it seems so sloppy. Um, all, and, and that, again, kind of terrifies me more. The possibility that you might have people running around with BZ in England dosing people. I mean, this is like straight out of like the sort of early day, you know, the 1950s MK Ultra Project Artichoke sort of stuff. I mean, that that is a very sort of troubling um, reality that we're facing. And I think in a lot of ways, it's scarier than these, you know, World War Three. We're going to it's going to happen in Syria at any moment. Because, again, I mean, the the we've talked about this before, Robbie, the threat of chemical weapons is so terrifying, rightfully so that you can whip people up into a much more sort of berserk-like frenzy over something like the, the, the Skripal stuff. I mean, imagine if it was 10 people that had been exposed to this. Um, what if they had died, you know? Yeah, it's really, I mean, it's, it is really frightening for well, pretty much all the reasons you just laid out. I mean, one of, one of them is, you know, is because we really don't know what happened. And it is, it does seem really sloppy, like that whoever, and I, and, and I have to keep going back to the idea, we don't really know what this is. So whoever did this and whoever concocted, and you know, it might've been two different, completely different entities, the person who did this, and then also the people who concocted this narrative around it might've been completely um, isolated from one another. So it is very frightening that, you know, this mysterious event happens and then all of a sudden the UK government comes out with all this, all these declarations about how they know it was Russia, they know it was Novichuk. Um, even just that alone, if we isolate that, um, that's extremely irresponsible to, to come out with information like that before any of the evidence is really in. And Craig Murray, um, you know, with someone going on the news, uh, you know, weeks ago saying that the, the actual investigators can't, can't prove this came from Russia, that they don't have the evidence that it did. And he was actually vindicated um, later when Port and Down came out with their official report and essentially said the same thing. So he must have had sources in, on the inside that, that kind of knew the scoop, that this was sort of a propaganda campaign being blasted out there while the actual evidence wasn't there. So you have to wonder why would they do that? Um, and, you know, that, you know, it, the more conspiratorial minded part of myself might say, well, they did that because they did it. You know, they might have been behind it and they just didn't care if there was any evidence. But, uh, you know, my mind kind of goes towards sort of, um, you know, it's someone who has access to these chemicals. So it's giving the appearance that a state actor is somehow behind it. But yet, is it a state actor? I mean, that's the question that I think really needs to be raised is we assume when things like polonium, you know, for example, were used on Litvinenko and this, um, and, you know, this apparent Novichuk incident in the UK, it's designed to give the appearance that it was done by a state actor, just like a chemical weapons attack in Syria is also designed to give the appearance it was done by some kind of state actor. But I feel like we need to throw that assumption out the window because obviously on some level, someone is playing games here to try to make <laughs> different countries think that state actors are attacking them. Um that's where my mind goes in all this. And I know that sounds very speculative, but it's hard not to b believe that there is some kind of kind of game being played here to try to pit different people against one another. I think it's very possible that the UK or Russia had absolutely nothing to do with this. And then it might have been <laughs> another A entity entirely. Yeah, it could have been an Israeli um, intelligence operation. It could have been US. I mean, that was, that's kind of where my mind tends to go. I, I think less likely that it was actually a UK entity that pulled this off because it also, it just seems very sloppy. It doesn't seem like they had the narrative nailed down very well in terms of from just the UK side of it. No, uh, entirely. Or, or, um, you know, almost like a, like a safari club, you know, like a, a, a private intelligence, um, you know, like a global private intelligence organization, um, that maybe just wants to pit uh, the UK and Russia against one another. Um, it's fascinating. Robbie, I don't know if you saw this. I, I, um, I was just sort of uh, looking at it before we went on the air, but uh, there's a, another, this is on Intel News, but another um, ex-KGB you know, uh, agent who now lives in the United Kingdom 
is set to be questioned by British police after alleging there is a link between the recent poisoning of Sergei Skripal and the mysterious death of a British intelligence officer in 2010. Now, this is um, the the uh, KGB, the former spy in question, is Boris uh, Karp, Karpchikov. I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. And he's saying that there is some connection between Skripal's poisoning and um, uh, Gareth Williams. Um, and Gareth Williams, it, it, um, you know, he was the um, – he worked for GCHQ, and he was the one that was found, like, in a bag. Um, people might remember this. And he, he turned out to be a cross-dresser as well, and there was some sort of speculation that someone was blackmailing him. And he was, like, found in a duffel bag, um, and that he was, like, into bondage and stuff like that. And his death is still, as of yet, unsolved. Um, I don't believe they've really found anything uh, other than that it was, you know, it, it, it may not have been an accident, although they, they're they not really totally clear on that. But it, it's just sort of like, here's yet another level. Again, some former KGB spy, obviously defected and lives in, in the UK, is coming out of nowhere saying that Skripal's poisoning, even though we really don't know that it's even Russia, that has some connection to a GCHQ guy who was murdered most likely years ago in another unsolved crime that they've they've loosely linked to russia um because he might have been looking into i think russian money laundering or something like that um i believe through the russian mafia as if gchq even really cares about that you know what i mean um so. of course they don't i mean even even <laughs> someone at a press conference with with Theresa may right after she did the bombing one of the first questions was if you're linking this, you know, this air, these airstrikes on Syria to the Skripal incident and you're claiming that, you know, it's a chemical weapons attack in Syria and a chemical weapons attack on the UK, why don't you go after the Russian money in the UK like the US is doing? And I don't really know even if that's true, if the US is really severely going after the Russian money. But, um, I mean, it seems like they, they are making less moves against sort of the Russian money in the UK than they are here. So, um, mm. Yeah, it's very, very strange. Um, but, I mean, just going based on what you just said, I mean, there has been so many incidents just in the last year where the U.S. media here is trying to spin um, <clears throat> Russian, mysterious Russian deaths or just like yeah. deaths of Russian officials with some kind of assassination or hit job. And the, one of the most recent ones I saw that I, that I was surprised didn't, didn't get much coverage at all which was something by Jason Leopold, who calls himself, or they, you know, the U.S. government used to call the FOIA terrorist, oh, who I, yeah. I believe used to do a lot of good work uh, back in the day when he was pulling a lot of um, government records. But now he seems to have turned quite strongly in the direction of promoting this sort of, dis, you know, this disinformation war against Russia, I would describe it. And in one of his most recent articles for BuzzFeed, he interviews four former DOJ officials who are claiming that, um, and I believe his name is Mikhail Lesson. I'm not sure. I might be totally getting the name wrong. Yeah, but they're the claiming former that, head of RT, right? Yeah, they're claiming that his death was actually forensically shown to be some kind of murder, but mm -hmm. Obama's DOJ covered it up. Now, it doesn't actually say <laughs> that explicitly in the article that Obama, the, the Obama administration covered up a murder of a Russian official, but that's essentially what the subtext of the article is. And I found that very, very bizarre um, that there are former, you know, Department of Justice officials trying to claim that Obama, that Eric Holder and Obama, like, tried to, you know, bury this. And, you know, I don't know what to make of stuff like that. Um, it just it just seems awfully strange that, um, that the, you know, the Obama administration would really willingly cover up a murder, but that's essentially what they're saying. And then also... Um, there was this uh, this Russian investigative journalist who fell from a balcony, and of course, every you know resistance and media pundit under the sun are making jokes about how Putin killed him. You know, mm. um, but I, I guess I just go I, I bounce around to all these different incidents we've heard about in the last you know ten fifteen years about Russians who have been assassinated by Putin, and how much coverage that gets here in the U.S. media in. I go back to Litvinenko and also have to remember that that, you know, had some weird 
intertwined connections with MI5 and UK intelligence. And even the way that that murder was apparently solved, that this is a very bizarre story that it's just hard to believe on its face, but this is the official story that the MI5 claims that they did an investigation on the ground in Russia to trace radiation trail from the polonium directly to Putin's own presidential office headquarters. Yeah. Um, and that that's just a very, very bizarre claim. And I'm surprised, frankly, that not even like, you know, I mean, I would expect at least a handful of generic you know, reporters here in the United States to really deeply look into that and be like, that seems a little bit too cartoonish, to be honest. I mean, is that really what the narrative that people are lat- that have latched onto and have just accepted? That's very odd to me that that's been accepted because that just sounds c- totally cartoonish on its face. I mean, and the other main one they pull out was Anna Poliskaskaya, who was killed in the lobby of her apartment building on Putin's birthday. And even though they tried and convicted several of the people who were involved in killing her, people here still say Putin killed her because he did it on her birthday. She was invested. She was looking into his corruption. Case closed. You know, that's how oversimplified the narratives are here. Now, it's very interesting to me when you flip the other side of it. It's like no one in Russia talks about Frank Olson. No one in Russia Mm -hmm. talks about (laughs) Robert Stevens, the guy who was killed with weaponized anthrax made by the U.S. government. No one talks about Bruce Ivins. How often did Russian media talk about Michael Hastings accidentally crashing his uh, car at 80 miles per hour into a, a palm tree? I mean, mm-hmm. so it's just very interesting that we talk all about how, oh, this Russian media uh, you know, propaganda machine is making us you know, distrust our institution, is sowing all this divide and making us think our government's capable of all this evil. But yet our media here constantly is throwing stuff at Russia – claiming that Putin is just killing person after person, you know? I mean, and I, it's just so fascinating to me that you, you will rarely ever see someone on Russian media ever making a claim as extreme as saying, you know, Trump murdered this person or Obama murdered this person or Bush murdered this person. So I, I, I guess I'm just, I'm going off on a total tangent about how frustrating it is of this double standard that somehow the most powerful empire on the planet doesn't kill dissidents or journalists and only Russia does, it's absolutely unbelievable to me. And we know that that's not true if you just look at the facts. But yet, you know, we can't prove that Robert Stevens was a hit job by the U.S. government. But yet, if you lay out all that evidence, so say if Robert Stevens was Russian and Russian anthrax Mm -hmm. was sent through the mail and it killed him, I mean, what would we think here? We would think, oh, of course Putin did it. I mean, that's how oversimplified mm. our lens is here, looking over there. Mm. No, I, I completely agree with you, Robbie. And I, I do find it uh, increasingly frustrating, th- this sort of perception, again, that, that Putin is like literally sitting in the Kremlin signing off on, yeah, murder this person and kill this person. And uh, I want to, you know, dispose of the body. Um, I, I just... I don't really think that's quite how it works. Um, I mean, and again, you can look at um, uh, what was it? Uh, um, uh, Nemtsov, Boris Nemtsov's murder. Um, yeah. Now, obviously, I do think the, there was a Russian government hand in that, but I lean much more towards that being Ramzan Kadyrov acting on his own in order to, um, you know, show his loyalty to Putin. Now, you know, again, I don't think Putin had anything to do with that murder. I don't think he was fully aware of it at all, it, you know, uh, but yet it did happen. And, uh, of course, everyone is going to say, oh, well, even if it was Kadyrov, you know, Putin, he, he kind of knew, wink and a nod, um, when it, that really doesn't seem to be the case. Um, so, you know, again, I mean, the, the Russian intelligence is a larger apparatus beyond Putin. Um, I'm sure there are many things that they are doing that Putin has no idea about. I mean, I understand that Putin is 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 quite clued into all of this, but even so, it's Russian. Russia is a huge country. Russian intelligence is vast. He's not going to know every single little tiny detail that's going on because, again, I mean, you know, if you're if if you are a good criminal leader, you're not going to know it. You know, you delegate things out. Um, but beyond that. Uh, there's also this, like, like you said, this cartoonish nature 
to these killings, which just don't seem like the hallmarks of Russian intelligence. Um, if, you know, if Russian intelligence is going to kill somebody, it's going to be a bullet in the back of the head or possibly, a, you know, a very powerful bomb. Um, that's sort of more their method, not let's uh, strangle a man, uh, you know, and, and put him inside a duffel bag. Let's, um, you know, uh, spray them with, uh, you know, Novacek. Uh, you know, it's in, in the middle of like a, a crowded town in the UK. I mean, that's just not really how Russian intelligence kills people. Uh, you know, I think that's much more a hallmark of like CIA um, or, you know, you mentioned before Israeli intelligence. I mean, you know, Mossad was known um, to uh, a, a, I think it's the uh, leader of Hamas is has no hearing in one of his ears because um, a bunch of Mossad agents broke into his hotel room, I think it was in Abu Dhabi, and poured poison in his ear. I mean, talk about complicated. Why don't you just shoot him? <laughs> um, you know, or, or, or strangle him or something like that. Um, again, and the, the, the cartoonish nature to this, of course, is just part of the propaganda. You know, it, it's the same thing like Kim Jong-un fed his uncle to a bunch of rabid dogs, you know, in some sort of like uh, Roman-esque style, like gladiatorial... <laughs> Um, you know, uh, like ring or something like that. Again, I'm not, I'm not totally sold on if Kim Jong Un wanted to murder his his brother, why not just send an actual team and kill him? Why, you know, rub a, a face cloth with sarin or VX or whatever? I mean, it's overkill. Um, you know, and it, it just it plays is. into that. You know, that's how evil they are. Um, you know, it, it, Putin is so crazy. He would use polonium to, to kill Litvinenko as opposed to just shooting him in the back of the head. I mean, there's a lot of, um, you know, uh, places like Kiev are, you know, full of hitmen right now uh, on all sides. You know, it's sort of like a hitman's paradise. You can make a lot of money in Kiev and, and a few other places, but Kiev in, in particular bumping off various people that the Russians and the Americans and the German, you know, people that they don't like. It's one of Chechen uh, hitmen operating there. Um, when that happens, it's they're, they're, it's well done. You know, it's, it's a gun with a silencer. You shoot somebody. Bombs placed on cars where only the passenger is killed, you know, not the driver. I mean, that's how you, that's like a good assassination. Not using polonium <laughs> um or or uh you know bz uh aerosolized gas i mean it just doesn't make any sense it all, all it really does is just sort of uh create this image of putin as the sort of ultimate again i mean it's like assad is like hitler because he used chlorine gas putin is like hitler mm -hmm. because he's using these sort of uh cartoonish ways of killing people um again not even really mentioning why even kill skripal what what does he know and why no, and was his daughter trying to go back to Russia? And it's all designed. I mean, if you just look at it from a PR perspective, it all has the effect of making the U.S. and the U.K. seem like moral actors on the global mm. stage. And I think that at a base level, that's what a lot of this is designed to do. As long as we can continually paint, you know, Russia or, Assad, or Syria, Assad in this matter, as being more evil than the things that we're willing to do, even if it's just by a little bit, you know, just using using chemical weapons instead of just massive Moabs or whatever, um, then that's that has the necessary effect of making it making it seem like America's actually we're not that bad because there's these other actors in the world that are just so much more horrible than us and that kill you know ex spies of theirs in broad daylight in Salisbury. Um, I mean, I think on a psychological psychological level, that's the effect it's designed to have. I mean, the Alexander Litvinenko incident is very, I think, has a lot of parallels to this, this Skripal's poisoning. One of the parallels is that, um, you know, well, I guess Litvinenko died as a result of his uh, poisoning, but he was alive for a while talking. And if I, you know, if I could take a guess, I would be willing to guess that they perhaps wanted the Skripals to actually be able to talk from their hospital bed, just like Litvinenko, maybe hoping hoping um, that uh, that Sergei Skripal would actually die in the hospital and might have some final words in his hospital bed to really slam dunk that whole sort of PR <laughs> machine. You know, it would it would create an, the, 
exact same imagery as Litvinenko in the hospital bed laying down saying Putin did this. Um, I think they wanted that. But obviously something went off track at some point because we didn't get it. It's almost like there's a blockade on the hospital. Where are the pictures the of point- them in the hospital? Exactly. And also the fact that Russian intelligence allegedly even had to like record the phone call because there's such a, a, a media blockade on what's going on there. Um, it's very interesting. I mean, and it raises a lot of questions. And then, you know, Tom and I, you know, we discussed this a little bit, but Porton Down, the actual lab that has all this chemical weapons and biological weapons research going on at it, um, is only eight miles away from the actual location of the attack. So that's also very, and a very odd coincidence. Mm-hmm. Right. Again, it's not like a smoking gun, but it's just sort of, a, you know, of all the gin joints in the world, uh, they just happen to pick Salisbury, which is right next to Port and Down. Um, yeah. You know, it, it does. And, again, if if this was if this was if uh, two American uh, spies were killed in a Russian park uh, down the down the road from Russia's Port and Down, of course, you know, I mean, come on, we would all be wondering um th- these sorts of questions uh you know that's would, why i think just... it's i was just going to say that's why it's dangerous for the establishment to to be putting out essentially what are conspiracy theories it's dangerous for them in the sense that people can you know use that same conspiracy or speculative logic and look at it from the other side and be like well wait you know i mean i even hear mainstream media figures now you know, not using the term false flag necessarily, but alluding to the fact that the, you know, Assad chemical weapons attack that just happened could be a false flag. And I think that's part of the, you know, part of what happens when you start amping up the conspiracy theories from the establishment side, from the UK side, from the US side, is they can come back at you and actually, you know, alternate conspiracies can come into the mix and destroy your narratives more easily. So it's a mm-hmm. very strange era that we're in right now um, in terms of, you know, this disinformation information wars, um, you know, even just going back to this BZ claim that Sergei Lavrov said, you know, was that just him throwing something at the wall to see what stuck? Or is this like right. a strategic alternate narrative that, that has some legs or is he telling the truth? I mean, it's, it's really hard to tell what's going on right now. And I'm not saying it's the fault of Russian propaganda or anything like that. I think it's very much the fault of the U.S. is in some kind of serious decline. Um, their empire is. They're hurting. And they're, and, and they're trying to throw everything at the wall to see what sticks, too. So mm. Mm. it's um, – I mean, so going back to what you said at the very beginning of this broadcast, I mean, I, I do think that this desperation that we're seeing coming out of the media class here and the, and the government here about Russia is a sign that we are in severe decline, essentially. Oh, absolutely. And, and um, you know, I think that we're in such a decline that countries like the UK and also particularly France are viewing this as an, an opening. And that's why we see Macron taking credit for everything in Syria that's happened. That's why we see Theresa May, um, you know, giving this very, you know, what she gave like a three hour speech to parliament about the, the, the Syrian airstrikes and, and how this is linked to Skripal. Uh, that's why we've seen, um, you know, some most likely MI5, MI6, um, you know, uh, st- um, terrorist bombings uh, or you know, orchestrated terrorist bombings in the UK uh, to prop up May. And I think to sort of, you know, again, there is this opening um, towards maybe something of a multipolar world. Um, but it, it no, I mean, it, it's like you said, it, it's quite disturbing. Um, and I guess, Robbie, to to kind of. Bring it back, because again, the, I don't think we're, World War III is necessarily going to start over the, the Skripal poisoning, but it there is something quite terrifying that that they would go to that level of poisoning people like this, and con, you know, conceivably exposing God only knows how many people to this. I mean, it does seem as if it was fairly contained, um, even though that kind of raises questions about well, how were they poisoned then? Um, you know, shouldn't there be other people that are affected by this, which sort of lends credence to the idea that this is not what it seems. But this to me is, is kind of more terrifying that they're willing to go to a level like that in order to, 
you know, stick it to the Russians. Because, I mean, it's not it's not as if what are we going to do? Invade is is Theresa May going to invade Moscow over this? No, I mean, they have any. What did they do? They expelled some some spies. That's about it. Um, You know, it's more terrifying to me that they're willing to poison people like this. Uh, And I don't know. I mean, I don't want to be too doom and gloom, but I can only assume we haven't seen the end of this. Uh, Any thoughts on that, Robbie? No, I think I think you're right. It is it is a very unprecedented. I mean, in terms of this this era we're in right now, um, that there's this you know cluster F in Syria happening, and that this happens now. I I think it's um, it's extremely terrifying, and someone is playing very fast and loose with um, with you know these these tactics uh, right now. And yes, while I do think the idea of World War Three, in terms of striking a few chemical weapons, apparently chemical weapons facilities in Syria, um, leading to World War Three is is perhaps hyperbolic. I think that this Skripal incident and whoever conducted this attack, if it even was an attack, you know, um, that to me has much more of a uh, possibility of of tipping us over the edge into some kind of um, escalated scenario. And by that, I don't necessarily mean like a nuclear war. Mm-hmm. I just mean some kind of hot war with Russia or things escalating in Syria to a point that we, we won't be able to pull back. Um, and yeah, it's very, very, uh, frightening. And, um, I just hope that, you know, there's, there's enough skeptical people out there. You know, there seems to be plenty of skepticism out there about these repeating chemical weapons attack in, in Syria, which is good. Um, but there needs to be more skepticism, especially in the U.S. and the U.K. when it comes to these allegations about Russia, because I think when you really peel back the layers, this is what it's really about. I mean, you know, trying to link a supposed chemical weapons attack in Salisbury with Assad's gas attack later mm-hmm. on. I mean, I think that that was the key to basically what they needed to do to get this sort of world consensus or this perception of a global consensus on bombing Assad. Um, if Salisbury did not happen, I highly doubt that we would have seen the France, uh, the French, UK, and US um, coalition bombing Syria. I have a feeling that it, it might have just, you know, might not even been able to cohere the way that it did. Um, and it does, you know, and the whole idea of like, what's Trump, where does Trump fit into all this? I'm still very confused about that because, you know, everyone's out there saying that Trump ran on a pro peace platform and that he's anti intervention and all this, all this crap, which I think is frankly just reading tea leaves, Rorschach politics. People just heard what they wanted to hear. This guy also said he wanted to bomb the S out of everybody. He wanted Mm -hmm. to bomb everything until there's nothing left. He was a bloodthirsty total war hawk, you know, talking out both sides of his mouth, but yet, you know, Everybody um, who claims to be anti-war right now, they're not going after Trump that hard for this. And I find that particularly strange because even Theresa May put a part in her speech where she said this is not about regime change. This is not going to be a sustained effort. She knows, you know, she's smart enough to know that people in the UK don't want regime change for the most part. Trump made it sound like in his speech that this is going to be like an unending assault on Assad's forces it didn't say anything about this, like not being about regime change or anything. He didn't even try to like ease people's minds about it. And I find that particularly notable because it just really just goes to show that Trump is just a – he just blows in the wind and doesn't care <laughs> at all about this mm-hmm. idea of anti-intervention. I mean if anything, it's all based around his own ego. He just doesn't want to have the legacy of like George W. Bush on his shoulders. It's not for any sort of moral or – you know, good reasons why he doesn't want regime change. I mean, I I, frankly, I don't even know if he does anymore because Bolton is there right next to him. So absolutely. Well, we, we, it is a nightmare and uh, one that we'll have to pick up later. Uh, Thank you so much, Robbie Martin. Again, please check out MediaRoots.org and a very heavy agenda.com. Thank you all so much for listening. I will be gone. Um, for the next two weeks, but I will have an episode um, for next Tuesday, but I'll, I'll be off for the first week in May, so my apologies, but uh, until then, I will be talking to you all very soon. No rules. No rules. No t-
taboo topics. No taboo topics. No fear of doom. No fear of doom. We are. We are American Freedom Radio. American Freedom Radio. Simply Clean Foods is dedicated to providing the best quality food you can buy next to fresh from a farmer's market. Our stringent quality controls and absolute zero GMOs plus testing for heavy metals makes us unique in the storable foods market. Our line of fruits, vegetables, and meats are suitable for everyday use, and you won't have to worry about throwing away valuable groceries ever again. Take out the amount you need and reseal the package for use within the next six months. Simply Clean Foods' primary focus is to bring clean food to people all around the world and change the way we look at freeze-dried food in our daily cooking. Go to simplycleanfoods.net. That's www.simplycleanfoods.net today. We all know that they're not telling us the truth. So stand up for your rights, demand the real medicine, and your right to use it and grow it. This is Rick Sensen, and you're listening to American Freedom Radio. American Survival Wholesale is a proud sponsor of the American Freedom Radio. And when you purchase quality products from AmericanSurvivalWholesale.com, you help support this program. Our quality non-GMO foods do not contain MSG, high food dose corn syrup, or heavy metals. At American Survival Wholesale, you can choose from over 8,000 quality products, including self-defense weapons, bug-out bags, and long-term storable food at wholesale prices. We also have custom food packs available, including gluten-free, dairy-free, and vegetarian packs. If we don't have it, (laughs) you don't need it. American Survival Wholesale is a veteran-owned and operated company, which also supports our veterans in need, and we are very active in disaster relief. If you would like to become a distributor, please email us at bugoutamerica at usa.com or call 818-720-0759. We offer free consultations to answer all your questions. Do it today while things are calm. That's americansurvivalwholesale.com. Assassination. You know what's interesting about assassination? Well, not only does it change those popularity polls in a big hurry, but it's also interesting to notice who it is we assassinate. Do you ever notice who it is? Stop to think of who it is we kill. It's always people who've told us to live together in harmony and try to love one another. Jesus, Gandhi, Lincoln, John Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, Martin Luther King, Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, John Lennon. They all said, try to live together peacefully. Bam! Right in the f- Hey, apparently we're not ready for that. Yeah, that's difficult behavior for us. We're too busy thinking around, sitting around trying to think up ways to kill each other. Here's one we came up with. It's efficient, too. Genocide, you know? Killing large numbers of people simply because they don't look like you, they don't talk like you, and they don't have the same kind of hats you do. <laughs> you ever notice that anytime you see two groups of people who really hate each other, chances are good they're wearing different kind of hats. <laughs> Keep an eye on that. It might be important. You're listening to AmericanFreedomRadio.com, the network who perseveres in delivering intelligent debate, constructive dialogue with true independence. The freedom to broadcast the truth is not free at all. So what is American Freedom Radio worth to you? The empowering information with fun, honest and pure integrity behind it provides an example to follow, friendships to flourish with the moral altruism that pulls no punches. The hosts sacrifice and show remarkable discipline in their duty to deliver quality radio and service to the community with strength, wisdom, and loyalty. The founders of AFI wish to thank you personally for sharing your views and insights to make the best radio and alternative media. Now it's time for you to give something back and play a vital role in the future of America. Be as generous with us as we've been with you. Click on the donate banner at AmericanFreedomRadio.com or volunteer by emailing AmericanFreedomRadio at Ymail.com. Vaccine, psychotropic drugs, and artillery batteries not included. Freedom Radio. 